What's up guys, it's Dolmater here and today we're going to be reacting to another Kings and Generals video. So this one is the Battle of Taranto, 1940, the Pearl Harbor of the Mediterranean. So we've actually done two videos on this before. We did one from uh, Historygraph and I can't remember who the other one was from. Uh, but we, this is going to be the third video we've watched on this. I'm not sure how much it's going to differ from those other videos. Uh, this one is quite a bit longer. I think those ones are both around 10 minutes. This one's about just shy of 20 minutes long. Uh, so I'm guessing there's going to be a little bit more information, but I'm not entirely sure. So anyway, link to the original video down below. Let's jump into it. The devastating surprise attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941 was the brainchild of Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto, and it had probably been influenced by two things. A prophetic novel, The Great Pacific War, written in 1925 by a British writer, Hector Charles Bywater, which gave a realistic account of a clash between Japan and the United States, beginning with the Japanese destruction of the US Pacific Fleet, and the Battle of Taranto, during which the British Royal Navy launched the first. So that's interesting. I've never heard of that book before. So I'm assuming it's, is it a novel or is it a like political work, like a theoretical, like is it actual theoretical work or is it just like a, a you know, novel type thing? It's like an alt history novel. All aircraft ship to ship naval attack in history against the Italian Regia Marina docked in Taranto Harbor. Today we're going to talk about this battle that is relatively unknown, but changed so much. The sponsor of today's video, World of Warships Legends, wants to help in recreating famous modern naval battles like Taranto in a massively multiplayer online game where you can master the seas in history's greatest warships. Recruit legendary maritime commanders, upgrade your vessels, and stake your claim to naval supremacy with or against players around the world in thrilling and immersive battles. World of Warships Legends is available to download for free from the PlayStation and Microsoft stores, so you can play this game with visually stunning graphics both on the old and new generation of consoles. There are numerous ways to play, as you can select so many ship types, nations, and commanders. World of Warships Legends gets a constant stream of new updates, and now you can play with aircraft carriers. Aircraft carriers appearing on the battlefield will make matches more exciting and gameplay more challenging, and will diversify strategic scenarios, allowing you to maneuver your squadrons, launch torpedoes to cause flooding, drop bombs to start fires, and incapacitate warship modules. The carriers are represented by three warships from the US and three from the Japanese fleet of World War II. Support our channel and test your metal and skill in epic naval battles by downloading the game via the link in the description. Thanks to World of Warships Legends for sponsoring this video. Is Legends a different game than the main During World the of Warships? Second World War, Britain held Alexandria, Gibraltar, Crete and Malta, with the latter serving as a refueling point for Allied vessels between Alexandria and Gibraltar, as well as a submarine base. Malta served as a major thorn for Italian supply lines to North Africa. Britain has devised plans to attack Taranto as early as 19... You know what I still don't get? Malta wanted to join the UK. Like, when the British Empire was, uh, you know, like, when they were decolonizing, Malta wanted to join the UK and the British refused. Would have been, like, I'm surprised they didn't hold on to it. It would have been such a great asset for them. 1935, after Italy invaded Abyssinia, in order to blunt the power of the Italian Navy, the Regia Marina. In 1938, during the Munich Crisis, the British commander of the Mediterranean fleet, Admiral Sir Dudley Pound, was concerned about the survival of the fleet if Italy attacked, so he ordered his staff to re-examine the battle plans against Taranto. Captain of the HMS Glorious, Lumley Lister, advised him that his fairy swordfish biplane torpedo bombers were capable of night attacks, inspiring the battle plan codenamed Operation Judgment. In 1940, both nations' supply lines to their respective North African campaigns were suffering, as the supply convoys had the ordeal of traversing the Mediterranean under the threat of the other's fleet. The British supply convoys to Egypt had to cross the Mediterranean Sea via Gibraltar or Malta, dangerously close to Sicily, or take the long route around the Cape of Good Hope and coming up the Suez Canal. 
While the latter was a long and slow route, going through the Mediterranean was far more costly, as the Italian navy was in an excellent position to intercept them. Italy was following the fleet-in-being concept, keeping their warships in harbour and not risking a battle at sea where they might lose them, while the British sought a decisive naval battle because Italy's strategy stopped Britain from separating naval forces in the Mediterranean under fear the Italian navy would destroy them. Thus, for the Italians, this defensive strategy served to hinder British operations at little cost. Alongside the Italian problem was the fall of France and the consequent loss of the French fleet in the Mediterranean. Britain could not allow French warships to fall into Axis hands and had to devise a plan yeah, to neutralize them. them. And steal on them. This prompted the <clears throat> British Royal Navy to perform Operation Catapult on the 3rd of July 1940, a naval attack against the French ships in the naval base of Mers el Kabir at Oran in French Algeria. What is significant about this attack was that on the 8th of July, British carrier HMS Hermes deployed six swordfish torpedo bombers of the 814 squadron, which struck the French battleship Richelieu's starboard side, tearing a hole and severely damaging her. The British pilots had gained valuable experience at aerial torpedo attacking a large ship at port, mere months before Operation Judgment was to take place. It was scheduled for October 21st, 1940, on Trafalgar Day. Operation Judgment's naval task force was commanded by Rear Admiral Lister and consisted of the carrier HMS Illustrious, heavy cruisers HMS Berwick and HMS York, light cruisers HMS Gloucester. I'm, I'm guessing the numbers in the brackets is how many planes they have on each of these. Durant Glasgow, destroyers HMS Hyperion, Elex, Hasty, and Havelock. Over 21 swordfish were to be deployed from the 806, 813, 815, 819, and 824th Naval Air Squadrons. The Fairy Swordfish was a biplane designed by the Fairy Aviation Company and introduced in 1936. The slow speed of the aircraft required it to make long straight approaches, but the aircraft had one unique perk, the ability to operate at night. Its strength lay in the ability to be thrown out during atrocious weather conditions, but still take off because of incredible handling and maneuverability. The Swordfish was reliable and ideal for safely launching from carriers, and this was critical at night. Half of the Swordfish were armed with 18-inch Mark II torpedoes, with the other half carrying 250-pound aerial bombs and flares for diversionary attacks. The torpedoes were fitted with a duplex pistol device that used duplex magnetic contact exploders. The Taranto force felt safe in their 40-foot deep harbour water, believing that airdropped torpedoes could not be effectively launched in such shallow waters. However, the British attached wire to each torpedo nose, holding it up as it fell into the water, producing a belly flop instead of a dive. This would allow them That's to be dropped in water as shallow as 20. So, how exactly do those wires work? They, they, like, I'm assuming it doesn't stay on, right? Obviously. So, like, where does it attach and what's it attached to other than the, the nose? 22 feet. Alongside this, the Italians were not aware of the duplex pistol innovation, which allowed torpedoes to explode underneath the ships, which would prove to be a critical oversight. The torpedo-equipped planes under moonlight would strike the battleships moored in the outer harbour, while the bombers would aim for ships and installations in the inner basin. The attack would consist of two waves, one coming in from the west towards the rising moon, and another from the north. Both waves would have aircraft shooting flares over the battleships to illuminate them. To protect the torpedo planes, it was decided that a distraction was required to keep the searchlights directed upwards and not directly at the torpedo planes. Yeah, the Thus, some early. of the dive bomber swordfish would attack the dockyards and ships in Mar Piccolo. Several reconnaissance flights by Martin Merrylands of the RAF No. 431 General Reconnaissance Flight, coming from Malta, confirmed the location of the Regia Marina. These scouts found the defences of Taranto to hold 101 anti-aircraft guns, 193 machine guns, and 90 low-flying barrage balloons. However, by early November, a storm had hit the port, leaving only 27 balloons. 
The Regia Marina present in Taranto during the battle consisted of six battleships, nine heavy cruisers, seven light cruisers, and 13 destroyers. The defences of Taranto Harbour consisted of anti-torpedo nets, but Italy had two problems, not enough netting and an inadequate design. Taranto's defence required 12,800 metres of netting, but they only had 4,200 metres when the attack occurred. The netting was designed to... If I'm not mistaken, I think I remember this from one of the other videos too, they hadn't pulled the netting back out because they weren't expecting an attack. I can't remember the exact reason, but I remember... <coughs> Excuse me. I think it was in the History Graph video. They were saying they didn't pull the netting back out for one reason or another, um, which was another issue. I can't remember why, though. Protect against torpedoes armed with contact pistols, protecting the sides of a battleship, and only had a depth of its maximum draft. Because of this, torpedoes could pass beneath the ship, providing almost no defense against the duplex pistol-armed torpedoes. The British had calculated a set run of 27 knots at a preset depth of 33 feet. This would allow the torpedoes to pass under the Italian anti-torpedo nets, while the duplex magnetic pistols would still sense a warship above and detonate. Operation Judgment was part of a larger operation called MB-8, requiring multiple naval forces to coordinate. The rationale for the complex movement of so many convoys and task forces was to confuse the Italian reconnaissance planes and not to give away the real intent to attack Taranto. Surprise for the attack was paramount. Thus, when HMS Illustrious left port on November 7th, it was publicly announced to be supporting a convoy on its way to Malta. During the sunset on November 10th, Illustrious secretly detached from the convoy fleet and headed northeast in a direction just 170 miles southeast of Taranto. The original date for the attack was October 21st, but because of a fire erupting on the HMS Illustrious, it had to be rescheduled for November 11th, a night that would hold enough moonlight for aircraft to launch. On the night of November 11th, 1940, 21 swordfish were launched in two waves, the first consisting of 12, airborne by 8.40 p.m., and the second consisting of 9 by 9.34 p.m. Six aircraft of the first wave and four of the second wave carried the 250-pound aerial bombs and flares. At 4 minutes to 11 p.m., the first wave split into two sections, with three bombers and one torpedo bomber straying from the main force. The smaller force continued to Taranto, while the main force approached the harbour at Mar Grande at 22.58. Over 16 flares were dropped east of the harbour by Lieutenant Kigel and Lieutenant Lam, while they bombed oil depots, setting them ablaze. The next three torpedo bombers, led by Lieutenant Commander Williamson's 815 Squadron, flew over Fulmine and Lampo, launching a torpedo and striking battleship Conte de Cavour, blasting a 27-foot hole in her side below the waterline. As Williamson tried to pull away from the Conte de Cavour, he was shot down by her anti-aircraft guns. Both Williamson and his co-pilot Lieutenant Scarlett survived crashing into the harbour, but were taken captive. The other two planes dodged the barrage blooms and were lightly hit by anti-aircraft fire from the Italian warships and shore batteries. They attempted to attack the battleship Andrea Doria, but missed. Lieutenant Kemp and Lieutenant Swain's plane. This is, this is really interesting. I like the different angles they're looking at this because the um, I, I can't remember. Oh, what was the other one? There was one was the history graph, and then I can't remember who the other video was from. Uh, the operations room, and I think they do a much better uh, job of displaying it in this video than they do in the other two. Um, the other, there were some interesting things in the other two, like the thing about the nets. There's certain things that. Uh, I think there was a weather issue that they were surprised by too, I can't remember. Um, so there's certain things that seem to have been left out here that were in the other video. Uh, but overall, I think the, the quality of like, the, the visualization of the battle itself is much better in this one. ...came around both sides of battleship Littorio, launching torpedoes, hitting her on the starboard bow and on the port quarter, sending Littorio into the mud bow first. Lieutenant Morn's aircraft came directly at the battleship Vittorio Veneto, launching a torpedo, 
but it ran aground before hitting her. The bomber force, led by Captain Opachrm, attacked two cruisers moored at Marpicolo, hitting both with a single bomb at 1500 feet. At 11.05 pm, Lieutenant Murray attempted to dive bomb the destroyer Lebeccio, but his bombs failed to detonate. Sub Lieutenant Sara could not manage to get close to a warship target and opted to bomb the seaplane base, severely damaging it. Sub Lieutenant Ford dropped bombs on a cruiser but was unable to confirm any explosions. The second wave of eight aircraft had one plane, flown by Lieutenant Clifford, accidentally collide with another aircraft while launching and required last minute repairs. Still, he launched 25 minutes oh, yeah, after yeah. to make a solo run. That, yeah, that's what it was. Wasn't no, I believe there's someone that went missing in the clouds or something too, and then he ends up being like way off course. I can't remember. It's been a long time since I've seen the video, but I, I, I forgot about that. That was another factor too, was that the one plane uh, ends up coming in like way late. The second wave approached from a northerly direction towards the Margrande Harbor. Lieutenant Hamilton and Lieutenant Skelton dropped flares shortly before midnight and headed towards the oil storage depots to bomb them. Commanding the force, Lieutenant- and So, you know, this is kind of just like a stupid little aside, but I grew up in a very, very Anglo town. Almost everyone I went to school with was English, Irish, or Dutch, or some mix of the three, right? Um, like basically everyone, even the people that were ethnic minorities, right? Mo they All of them were, you know, part English, Irish, or Dutch, except one girl who was uh, half black, half French. Um, but it's so funny because all these English last names, and there's a couple Irish last names in there too, like Lamb. All these last names are names of people I went to school with. So I instantly think of like that person as soon as they say the name. Like they said Williamson, I instantly thought of a guy I used to play that was on my rugby team. Uh, they said Lamb. I thought of a guy that has that last name. Like as soon as they say these last names, it's just like the first thing that pops into my head is these guys I went to high school with who had those last names. And Hale came from the north, lining up with the battleship Littorio. Alongside him was Lieutenant Torin Spence and Lieutenant Bailey. The latter was shot down on approach by the heavy cruiser Garizia's anti-aircraft guns. Both he and his co-pilot died. Hale and Torrin Spence both launched torpedoes at the Littorio, with one successfully hitting her on the stern. Despite taking heavy anti-aircraft fire, both aircraft managed to pull away. Behind them came Lieutenant Lear, launching a torpedo at Cayo Duilio, hitting her on the starboard side, blowing a hole in her hull, and flooding both of her forward magazines. The final aircraft of the second wave, flown by Lieutenant Wellam, coming over the town of Taranto, approached the flagship Vittorio Veneto, launching a torpedo that missed. His aircraft was heavily damaged by anti-aircraft fire, but managed to limp back to the illustrious. Arriving 15 minutes late and alone on the scene was Lieutenant Clifford. He attempted a dive bombing attack on the Italian cruiser Trento, facing the complete attention of all the anti aircraft fire. He dropped his bombs, only to see them cleanly hit Trento without detonation. Miraculously, he was able to fly out of Taranto through the heavy anti aircraft fire. The British lost two planes with two crew members taken. Man, that's gonna piss you off. You're late to the show, but you still want to go fight because you're like, all my boys are out there. They're fucking fighting. I'm not gonna be the one sitting back here not fighting. You finally get there. You drop some bombs, and then they just don't go off. They're duds. <laughs> so I'd be so. It's like, what the fuck did I even come out here for? <laughs> Prisoner and two killed. The Regia Marina suffered significant losses. The battleship Conte de Cavour had a 39 by 26 foot hole in its hull. 27 of her crew were killed with 100 wounded. She fell to the bottom of the shallow water with only her superstructure and main armaments remaining above water. She would never see full service again. The battleship Cayo Duilio had a 36 by 23 foot hole, but was saved before running aground. The battleship Littorio had been hit by three torpedoes, leading to considerable flooding and the ship's bowels being totally submerged by the next morning. 32 of her crew died, with many wounded. Heavy cruiser Trento was damaged by an unexploded bomb that tore a hole in one of her fuel tanks, taking two months to repair. Destroyers Lebeccio and Persegno, both hit by unexploded bombs, required minor repairs, taking a month each. 
It took four months to repair Latour. Man, so there's at least four bombs that didn't go off that were duds. Oreo. Seven months for Dulio, with Conte de Cavour never seeing completion. Two Italian aircraft were destroyed on the ground. The seaplane hangars, oil depots, and harbor were severely damaged. An estimated 15,000 rounds from shore fired batteries and warships had landed in the city of Taranto, which lay in shambles. The Italian fleet oh, lost half its God damn, so they're yeah, accidentally blasting their own fucking city because they're shooting up in the air at these planes. I mean, you know, the bullets got to come back down. I didn't even think, I never, actually never really thought of that. Like, you think about that when you're shooting, right? That's why they tell you don't shoot, don't shoot straight up in the air. But yeah, <clears throat> all of these, uh, like, anti-aircraft things, like, during the Blitz, for example, how many of those bullets ended up land landing back in London? I never even thought of that. Battle ships in one night. The next day, the Regia Marina was forced to transfer its undamaged warships from Taranto to Naples to thwart new attacks. The balance of power swung firmly into British hands in the Mediterranean, who could now operate with much greater liberty, capable of splitting into two battle groups rather than sticking as one at all times. Prior to the attack on Taranto, aerial torpedo experts around the world believed torpedo attacks against ships required water at least 75 feet deep. Taranto Harbour had a depth of 33 feet and the British were able to innovate their methods to compensate for this. Isoroku Yamamoto ordered Lieutenant Commander Takeshi Naito to investigate the incident, and he quickly flew to Taranto. His report went directly to Yamamoto, and he later spoke to Commander Mitsuo Fujida, the man who led the first wave of air attacks on Pearl Harbor. While the attack on Taranto was not the match to ignite the Japanese plans for Pearl Harbor, it demonstrated the soundness of such tactics and cemented Japan's resolve to go through with its plans. Prior to the attack on Taranto, Yamamoto's proposal for an attack on Pearl Harbor met with great resistance in both the military and naval circles of Japan. But after Taranto, support quickly grew for his plan. More videos on naval warfare are on the- I mean, It was just, you know, kind of a dumb idea. I mean, Japan was kind of fucked regardless, but like, you know, it's like, uh, I don't even know what to compare it to. It's like you're slowly dying and then you decide to kick a bear in the face. It's like, I mean, I guess your death's going to be faster now, but is that really a good thing? M maybe. The way. So make sure you're subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see the next video in the series. Please consider liking, commenting, and sharing. It helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members whose ranks you can join via the links in the description to know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord, and much more. Yeah, so this is a really interesting video. There was something, and the two things that I remember from the other ones that I, <clears throat> they, they didn't talk about in these ones, or in this one, I can't remember if it was from the History Graph video or if it was from the, uh, the other video, which I'm having a brain fart on again now. Uh, I can't remember which one it was from, but it, they had mentioned at first there was something about the weather or clouds or something that they ended up getting that one of the uh, planes got lost in. Maybe I'm mixing this up with another battle, though. Uh, and then the other one was uh, something about the nets of the nets not they, they were like not uh, pulled back out at the end of the day like they're supposed to be in order to protect the, the boats. Uh, I, I remember that being a factor. But again, maybe I'm mixing up battles here. We watch so many of these battle videos that they start to blend together to some degree. Uh, but, yeah, really, really good video. So, anyway, let me know what you think below. Like, comment, subscribe. I'll see you guys in the next one.